The Bronze Bow, Chapter 7. And the kings and the mighty and exalted and those who rule the earth shall fall before him on their faces. Joel's voice, hardly more than a whisper, trembled with earnestness as he read. He sat on the dirt floor of the passage, stooping to hold the scroll so that it caught the light from the one sputtering wick they dared to burn. His two listeners sat motionless against the wall, scarcely breathing, held by the music of the words and the spell of the ancient prophecy. And their faces will be filled with shame, and the darkness shall grow deeper on their faces. And he will deliver them to the angels for punishment, to execute vengeance on them because they have oppressed his children and his elect. The elect shall rejoice over them because of the wrath of the Lord of spirits resteth upon them, and his sword is drunk with their blood. Daniel leaned back, his face hidden in the shadows. The words were like the wine that Thesha brought to him every evening. He could feel them like fire in his veins, and tonight, for the first time, he was conscious of his own strength stirring within him. Five days and nights he had spent in this narrow passage, while the fever burned itself out and the pain in his side gradually eased. Soon now he must leave this place, and he must store up these words to take bath with him to the cave. Joel came to the end of the scroll. For a moment there was not a sound. Then Joel began to roll the papyrus carefully, and the girl beside him let out her breath in a long sigh. <sighs> Joel, she said thoughtfully, has father read the book of Enoch? Of course he has. Then why does he say that the Jews must not fight for their freedom? Father believes we must leave the future to God, that when God is ready, he will establish his kingdom on earth. Don't you believe that too, Joel? Joel's eyebrows drew together. In a way I do, he said, but the men of old didn't wait for God to win their battles for them. They rose up and fought, and God strengthened them. Maybe God is waiting for us now. It seems to me we've tried Father's way long enough. What do you say, Daniel? Daniel had been content just to listen. He envied Joel the ability to find so readily the right words. He scowled now with the effort to make them understand his thoughts. We've waited too long, he said. This Phineas, the one you read about last night, he pulled out his sword and killed the enemies of God, and God rewarded him for it. When will God send us another Phineas, Joel sighed. Suppose he did, Daniel burst out, ignoring the stab of pain in his side. One man is not enough. What could he do without an army, without men, thousands of men, and weapons to fight with? Why aren't we making ready? Isn't that what Rosh is doing up on the mountain? Yes, but Rosh can't do it alone. There are only a few of us. Daniel, Joel leaned forward, his eyes wide with sudden awe, his breath caught so that the words would scarcely come out. Did you ever think that Rosh, that he might be the leader we're waiting for? It was out at last, the thought that neither of them had dared to admit to the other. I know he is, said Daniel. They sat silent, trembling at the immensity of the secret they shared. He's like a lion, Daniel said, his confidence mounting. He has no fear at all. Up there in the cave, whatever he says, the men obey him without question. If there were more of us, if we could only get enough, Rosh would drive every cursed Roman back into the sea. Before Joel could speak, Malthus interrupted. But this Rosh is an outlaw, she protested. Surely God would not choose a man like that to bring his kingdom. Daniel bristled. He could not make this girl out. Was she for him or against him? She had hidden him and dressed his wound and brought him food. But before that, 
She had pleaded with him to leave Joel alone. She had done all of this for her brother, but wouldn't she still fight to keep Joel in this safe world? What difference does it make what Rosh is, he demanded. If he can get rid of the Romans, the kingdom can take care of itself. But it is the same thing, said Joel, victory and the kingdom. Call it what you like, Daniel said impatiently. All I know is I hate the Romans. I want their blood. That is what I live for. It's all I've lived for since. Since what, Daniel? Joel urged. Since they killed my father and mother. There was silence, and then Malthus said very gently, Tell us, Daniel. Daniel wavered. He was torn as he had been torn that first day on the mountain, between the desire to stay in hiding and the need to speak to them. No one in the cave knew all of his story. He never spoke of it. He dreaded to bring it up out of the secret places of his memory, but even more, he longed to share the burden that he had carried alone for so many years. It's not a good story for a girl to hear, he said. Is it about your mother? asked Malthus. About them both. If it's about my people, about another woman like myself, then I can hear it. Daniel stared at the blur of her face against the wall. Her eyes shone deep and steady. Was she for him or against him? He began to grope his way back, far back to the beginning. It was when I was eight years old, he told her. I was in the synagogue school then. My father was overseer of the vineyards. It was a good job. I don't remember ever being hungry or afraid. He used to tell us stories after the evening meal. He knew them all by heart. My sister was only five. She had yellow hair and blue eyes like our mother. That's because my mother's mother was a Greek slave who married her Jewish master. But my mother never knew any foreign ways. She believed in the God of the Jews. She taught us verses from the scripture and made us say them after her. I think we were like all the other families. Perhaps it's still like that in the houses in the village. Joel nodded. It was in our house, he said. My father had a brother, younger than he was, and they were very close. When I was very young, my uncle lived in our house with us, but then he married and went to live in the house of his own, not far away. I can remember the wedding. They let me walk in the procession, and I was so excited that I dropped my torch and burned a hole in my new coat. Daniel stopped and waited for a moment. This part, the good part, had been buried very deep. The others did not speak letting him find his difficult way back at his own halting pace. My uncle was so proud of his wife. When their first baby was born, a boy, you would have thought no one had ever had a son before. He did a very foolish thing. It was almost time for the taxes, and he took part of the money he had saved and bought his wife a present, a shawl with gold thread in it for her to wear in the naming. He planned to find extra work and make up the money. But that year, the Romans were building a new section of road, and the collector came early. My uncle should have come to my father, but he was ashamed because, of course, none of us ever had money to spare. So he tried to argue that it was not time. He was a very excitable man, and the collector was angry and reported him. The soldiers came and put him in the guardhouse. As soon as my father heard, he went to all his friends and collected enough money for the tax. But my uncle had lost his head and tried to fight his way out, and the soldiers would not let him off. They said he would go to the quarries to work off his debt. We all knew they would never let him go or that he would fight them and get killed. His wife was almost out of her mind. She came and put her arms around my father's knees and screamed at him. So my father made a plan. He was a peaceful man, but he armed himself. He and four others hid in a cornfield and waited till the Romans started for the city with my uncle. Then they attacked. 
Of course, they were all captured. One of the soldiers was cut with a sickle and he died that night. They wanted to make an example for the village. They crucified all six of them, even my uncle who had done nothing because his hands were tied behind him. There was a sound like a moan from Thacia. Joel did not move. After a moment, Daniel went on. My mother stood out by the crosses all day and all night for two days. It was cold and foggy at night, and when she finally came home, she did nothing but cough and cry. She only lived a few weeks. Were you there too? asked Thacia under her breath. Yes, I was there. After my father died, I made a vow. Maybe they would say a boy of eight years old couldn't make a vow and a real one that was binding, but I did. I vowed I would pay them back with my whole life, that I would hate them and fight them and kill them. That's all I live for. When he stopped speaking, he realized that he was trembling all over and the wretched cold sickness was climbing up into his throat. He wished they would go away now and leave him alone, but Thesha questioned him again. Who took care of you after that? My grandmother. She made me go to school for five years, but then she was ill and there wasn't enough to eat, and she sold me to Amalek. What about your sister? Daniel hesitated. Yes, they had to know this too. I told you she was only five. That night, she got away from a neighbor and ran out. They didn't know how long she had been there by the crosses before they found her and took her back. She used to scream in her sleep. Then she refused to go out of the house. If we tried to make her, she would howl till she was blue and fall into a sort of fit, and we would think she was dead. And then she would be ill for days. So we gave up. She has always been sickly. She doesn't eat enough, and I think she has forgotten everything, but the demons will never leave her. She's never gone out of the house. He stopped, helpless in his longing to make them understand Leah. She is very gentle and good, he added, looking humbly at Malthus. To his surprise, her eyes glistened with tears. He had to look away. Since the beginning of Daniel's story, Joel had not spoken a word. He sat now staring straight ahead of him. Somehow, in a few moments, he had grown older. The man he would become was revealed in his young face. All at once, he came up to his knees and knelt in the narrow space his shoulders taut. Daniel saw that his lips were trembling. Daniel, he choked, I will take the oath too. Before heaven I will avenge your father, I swear it, I will fight them as long as I live. Swept up by the boy's passion, Daniel was checked by a sudden stab of guilt. He had not intended this. Was it fair to win Joel in this way? No, he exclaimed, no, Joel, it is not your quarrel. But it is, cried Joel, mine and every other Jews. Your father is only one out of thousands that have died at their hands. We must do anything, anything to make the country free again. It was what he had wanted, what he had come to Capernaum to accomplish, but he was not sure. To drag Joel out of his safe scholar's life into the dark danger of his own world? Thacia understood. After one gasp of dismay, she sat huddled against the wall, staring at her brother with terror in her eyes. But behind the terror, there was pride. Joel turned to her. You see, it has to be this way, don't you, Thacia? I can't go on burying my head in a book while things like this are happening. You must see it. We've always seen things the same way. 
Faisha looked back at him, struggling against her fear. And there flashed across to Daniel something of what it must mean to be a twin. Then she drew a long breath. Yes, she said steadily, I do see. If I were a boy, I would make a vow too. Suddenly Joel's fire leaped up in her face. Why can't I, she cried. Why can't a girl serve Israel too? What about Deborah and Queen Esther? Let me swear it too, Joel. I promise to help you. Jealously beat suddenly up in Daniel. No, he exploded. This is a man's vow. It's not for a pretty child. Her face went white. At the hurt in it, Daniel cursed himself. What had made him say a thing like that to her? But this time, Joel came instantly to his sister's support. Then we will make a new vow, he said. The three of us together will swear to fight for Israel. For, for, he hesitated. For God's victory, said Phasia swiftly. Remember the watchword of the Maccabees. Yes, that's it. Come swear together. Now on the book of Enoch here. What could be better? Put your hands on mine, both of you. Swear to stand together, the three of us, for God's victory. Thasia laid her hand firmly over her brother's. For God's victory, she repeated. They looked at Daniel, waiting. The three of us, Joel had said, taking him who had always stood outside into the close circle of their lives. With an effort, he leaned over and laid his hand over the girl's. He felt the small, fine bones under his palm. For God's victory, he choked. He drew back quickly into the shadow, afraid for them to see his face. But they were far too lost in their own excitement to notice his. Now we must plan what to do, said Joel solemnly. Tomorrow night I'll bring... Oh, they should remember. Tomorrow night will be the Sabbath. Joel considered. We can come anyway, he decided. The law doesn't forbid visiting the sick. We can't unbind a wound or put on a fresh dressing. No matter, put in Daniel. The wound is almost healed. I'll bring the food before sunset, Thasia promised, enough to last through the Sabbath. We must plan, Joel went on, still lost in the wonder of his new resolve. When you go back to the mountain, I'm going with you. No, objected Daniel. That's not what Rosh wants of you. He wants a man here in Capernaum. Right now, it's better for you to stay in school. He could see that in spite of his vow, Joel was relieved. I'm willing to give up school, Joel insisted. I mean it. I'll do anything. Stay in school, then. We're not ready to fight yet. We've got to wait and work for it. Rosh has something in mind for you. I don't know what it is, but he'll send you word. You're sure? Yes, you can count on it. I've been thinking of a plan, Joel said. If you should bring a message from Rosh, or if you should ever need to get away from the Romans again, there's an opening in the outside wall at the angle where this passage joins the storage room. It's used to bring the sacks of grain in from the street, and it's just big enough for a man to crawl through. I tried it. I'll make sure it's kept unlatched and you can push it open. That way, no one will ever suspect you're here. How will you know it? Daniel asked. I thought of that. You could mark some sign on the wall. A bow, Thasia exclaimed. You know, from the Song of David you read last night. The bronze bow, Daniel exclaimed, pleased that Thasia too had remembered. Will you read that part again, Joel? I didn't bring the scroll, Joel said, but I know it by heart. He leaned back against the wall. God is my strong refuge and has made my way safe. He made my feet like hinds feet and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. It couldn't really be bronze, said Daniel, puzzled. The strongest man couldn't bend a bow of bronze. 
Perhaps just the tips were metal, Joel suggested. No, Thacia spoke. I think it was really bronze. I think David meant a bow that a man couldn't bend, that when God strengthens us, we can do something that seems impossible. Perhaps, said Joel. You do have an imagination, Thaish. He went on with the song of David. Thou hast given me the shield of thy salvation. Oh dear, Thaisha broke in dismayed. I just remembered. Father asked me to play for his guest tonight. Then we must go, said Joel quickly, gathering up the scroll of Enoch. Father likes to have Thaish play the harp for him, he explained, seeing David's bewilderment. Daniel looked at Thaisha. I've never heard a harp, he said. Then I'll bring it and play for you, she promised. No, not on the Sabbath, but I won't forget. Do you want us to leave the light, Daniel? No, said Daniel. I'm used to the dark. They crept along the passage, the light flickering and vanishing altogether. Then, very faintly, came the whispered words. Good night, Daniel. This time, he was certain he had heard them. He lay in the darkness, and it seemed that a warmth and light still glowed all around him. Together, Joel had said, three of us together, and Thatia was not against him. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. He could see the shining bow, the bow that no man could bend with his own strength alone. Suddenly he sat up. It came to him that Joel had given him the answer to his most urgent question. It was time for him to leave this place. For two days without their knowing, he had tested his strength, pacing back and forth in the narrow passage. Joel would try to keep him, better simply to go. They would be horrified that he'd chosen the Sabbath when a man could walk no more than 2,000 cubits from his home. But the law was for the wealthy, for the scholars, not for the poor. By now, he had broken so many points of the law that he was beyond all redemption. What matter if he broke one more? Toward morning, when he was sure that all the household would be asleep, he crawled along the passage. His fingers discovered a latch, and the little service door swung inward. He eased himself through the narrow slot into the street, pulled himself to his feet, and made his way through the city toward the mountain. I would like to have heard that harp, he thought once but he put that behind him. Instead, he repeated the song of David. He has made my feet like hind's feet and set me secure on the heights. All the same, he would like to know how a harp sounded.